Rites in their mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Now, here in the book of Genesis, we have this king, Kedorlaomer, and Amraphel, and these other kings, and they're coming against the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah because they have been rebellious. And as part of his campaign, as Kedorlaomer came into the um, Palestinian territory. He came down through Bashan and he smote the Rephaim there and these other tribes that's mentioned in these verses on his way to engage the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now all of these tribes were post-flood giants. The Zuzims are the Zamzumims of Deuteronomy chapter 2 verses 20 and 21. Deuteronomy chapter 2 verses 20 and 21. The Bible speaks of these people here and it says that also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumims, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. We find the Emims in uh, verses 10 and 11. The Emims dwelt therein in time past, a people great and many and tall as as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites call them Emims. And of course, the Horites are found in verse 12. They are the Horims. The Horims also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead as Israel did unto the land of his possession which the Lord gave unto them. Now these Rephaims that are mentioned, they are also giants. And the King James Bible defines them as giants for us. In Genesis chapter 14 and verse 5, the word Rephaim is left untranslated by the King James translators. In 13 other places in the King James Version of the Bible, the translators have translated the word Rephaim as giants. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 11, the word there in the Hebrew was Rephaim. In Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 20, the word translated, translated giants is Rephaim. Now that the Rephaim were indeed giants is proven by Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 11. We read here, For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. Now the word here again is translated giants from the word Rephaim. And this Og king of Bashan, his bed was thirteen and a half feet long. So he was a very, very big man. He was a giant. Now, in the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, the giants show up quite a number of times in those books, and there is a reason for that. Moses wrote these books during Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. He knew that the children of Israel was going to go into the land of Canaan, and they were going to face these giants in the land of Canaan. So Moses discussed these giants, where they come from, what their origin was, was for this new generation of Israelites who would inherit the land. 
because the promised land was the territory of the Rephaim. Look at Genesis chapter 15 and verses 18 to 20. Genesis chapter 15 verses 18 to 20. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims. So these giants were there in the land of Canaan. And when God gave the land of Canaan to the children of Israel, He was taking some of this land away from these giant tribes and giving it to the children of Israel. The giants were closely associated with the Canaanites, which may give us some insight into Noah's cursing of Canaan in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 25. The presence of the Rephaim in the land of Canaan is one of the reasons why God told the Israelites to destroy the whole population, to kill men, women, and children, and to leave no survivors. Because there was these giant tribes in the land of Canaan, and no doubt there was a certain amount of mixing with the Canaanites, and these people were carrying an illegitimate bloodline that God never intended to exist. And that's why that God was so hard in telling the Israelites to allow no survivors. Interestingly enough, in Genesis chapter 38, uh, Judah, the son of Jacob married a Canaanite woman and had three sons by her. The first two of them died, and if we, apparently from the genealogy, the third one had no children. God did not want the royal lineage of Judah mingled with these Canaanite people because they had a compromised bloodline. The giants were a cursed bloodline because they were an illegitimate variety of hybrids that God never intended to exist. Their origin is found in Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 to 4. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 to 4. And their origin went back to the days before the flood. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now these sons of God were angelic beings. Every other reference to the sons of God in the Old Testament is a reference to angels. All the earliest church fathers believed that the sons of God were angels here in Genesis chapter 6, as did all the rabbis of antiquity. The view that the sons of God were angels was the only view among the Jews and the only view in the early church until the third century. It 
it was Julius Africanus in the 3rd century that came up with this idea that the sons of God were the sons of Seth. And before that, such a view was never known in the early church. Now, interestingly enough, nature itself demonstrates that hybridization often produces very large offspring. If anybody here has ever been down to Myrtle Beach, they have there in North Myrtle Beach this attraction called the Alligator Adventure. And if you go there, you'll see all kinds of varieties of alligator and crocodile. And right there at the Alligator Adventure, they have a crocodile that is the largest crocodile on planet Earth. It is huge. It's unbelievable how large this animal is. Why is it so large? It's so large because it is a hybrid of a Philippine sea crocodile and a species of crocodile from Australia. And I've seen a Philippine sea crocodile up close and in person. And a Philippine sea crocodile is not even close to being as big as this hybrid is. The largest cats upon the earth today are hybrids between lions and tigers. They are much larger than any parent. This often happens in nature. And so when these fallen angels transgress the boundaries that God had set for them, the offspring was huge. And we see in verse 4 how they came to be after the flood. All of these pre-flood giants were destroyed in the flood. But in verse 4 we read, And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. This happened again on a more limited basis after the flood, and it produced the giants that we find in the books of Moses. Now, a large part of the Old Testament narrative concerns God's war against these giants. We read that God used the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Edomites to destroy some of them. And God sent the children of Israel into Canaan to destroy these other giants because they were a wicked and illegitimate hybrid species that God never intended to exist. Moses begins this war when he begins to have his conflict with Og, the king of Bashan, and it goes on through the book of Joshua, it goes on through the reign of Saul, and then over in the books of Samuel, we read in 2 Samuel 21, 16 to 22, how David's mighty men wiped out the last of the giants. It was a war against of God to destroy these people that he never intended to exist. Now Moses, before his death, led Israel to victory over the Amorites in the land of Bashan. Look at Numbers 21 and verse 33. Numbers 21 and verse 33. And the Bible says here, And they turned and went up by the way of Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, went out against them, he and all his people, to the battle at Edrei. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Fear him not, for I have delivered him into thy hand, and all his people and his land, and thou shalt do to him as thou didst unto Sion, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. So they smote him and his sons and all his people until there was none left alive, and they possessed his land." This land of Bashan had in ancient times been known as the land of the Rephaim. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 13. Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 13. And the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half-tribe of Manasseh in the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of giants. Now by the time of Moses, Og was the last of the Rephaim left in the land of Bashan. All the rest of them had been smitten during the time when Kedor Laomer came through. And by the time of Moses, Og was the only one that was left. The land of Bashan was east of the Sea of Galilee, and it encompassed the Golan Heights on its westernmost side. And I want to make a pivot here now and look at the word Rephaim itself. The word Rephaim is from the Hebrew root word Rawfaw. The word carries the idea of healing from its root. Hence some ancient traditions that the giants were healers. And this word can carry the sense of invigorating. And it's probably a reference to the strength that these giants had. But the word Rephaim also carries the meaning of feeble or weak. In the Hebrew Old Testament, Rephaim is consistently used to refer to those that have died. In the King James Version, the translators translated the word Rephaim as the dead seven times and as deceased one time. All right, Job 26 5 is an example. Job 26 5. Here in Job 26 5, the Bible says. Dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. That's the word Rephaim there, an example of how they translated it to refer to the dead. This verse is talking about the fact that way down beneath the ocean, the dead are down there in the underworld. All right. Thus, the word Rephaim also carries the meaning of spirits, shades, or ghosts in the Hebrew language. Keep this foremost in your minds as we go forward. Now, the ancient city of Ugarit on the northern coast of Syria was a city that, with a population that would have fit the description of being Canaanites. The Ugaritic language was very, very closely related to Hebrew in a manner similar to how Portuguese is closely related to Spanish. Now, three clay tablets have been found from the Ugaritic culture, which refers to the Rephaim. The Ugaritic culture regarded the Rephaim as being their deified dead ancestors. In the Ugaritic language, Rephaim meant the healthy ones, probably referring to the perceived well-being of the deified dead. Tablet 3 of the Rephaim tablets has this in one of its fragments. 
To his place the Rephaim went. To his place the divine ones went. The warriors of Baal and the warriors of Anat. So these Rephaim are viewed as being divine ones. They are considered to be the warriors of Baal. And so we can see here that the Canaanite Ugaritic culture saw the Rephaim as being divine beings. They were literally seen as the divine dead. And in light of this, I can't help but think of 1 Samuel 28.13 when Saul went to the witch at Endor And the Bible says, And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. I would suggest that this is probably related to this. Now it has been suggested by some scholars that the word Bashan comes from the Akkadian Basmu, which refers to a venomous snake or a snake dragon. And you want to keep this in mind. Og the giant was king over the land of the snake dragon. That's very provocative when we consider that Satan is the snake dragon in the Bible. Now we're going to start tying all of this together. When we read and study the Bible, it's very easy to get lost because we are living in the 21st century. We don't understand how the original readers of the Bible saw the world. And in particular, we often do not understand their point of view regarding the supernatural realm. The ancients widely connected demons to the giants. The ancient Greeks believed that the demons were the disembodied spirits of the heroes of the heroic age, and they believed that they lived in the air. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And a lot of times when you're reading these books about Greek mythology or if you've seen a movie like Troy, there's usually one thing that's left out. All these people like Achilles and Menelaus and Agamemnon and Jason and all these other Greek heroes the Greeks understood them to be giants. But this perspective was also shared by the ancient Hebrews and by the earliest of the church fathers. This view was doubtless tied to the fact that the Rephaim was connected both to giants and to spirits or ghosts. And remember as well that in Ugaritic, the Rephaim were the deified dead. This reminds me of Deuteronomy chapter 32 in verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 32 in verse 17. Speaking of Israel's idolatry, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not." So these gods that was worshipped by the ancients, they were demons, or as the King James Bible calls them, devils. Now I'm going to quote something, and I want to give you a disclaimer first. When I quote this, 
I'm not quoting this as any kind of scripture. I'm not quoting it as any kind of authority. And in fact, this writing is actually an example of Jewish Gnostic literature. But the rabbis believe that the giants became the demons after their deaths. And this is recorded in this ancient Jewish writing of First Enoch. And chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, this rabbinic tradition is reflected. This passage says, But now the giants who were begotten by the spirits in flesh, they will call them evil spirits on the earth, for their dwelling will be on the earth. The spirits that have gone forth from the body of their flesh are evil spirits. Evil spirits they will be on the earth and evil spirits they will be called. And although we don't accept the book of 1 Enoch as any kind of scripture, it does reflect the Hebrew culture and belief regarding the identity of the devils. All right, the second century church father, Justin Martyr, in his second apology of Justin for the Christians, in chapter 5, writes, quote, But the angels transgressed this appointment and were captivated by love of women and begat children who are those that are called demons. End quote. Justin was one of the very earliest writing church fathers after the time of the New Testament. And as strange as it may seem, the oldest view that we have record of in the ancient world concerning the identity of the devils is that they are the disembodied spirits of the giants. And this point of view offers us a good explanation of why the demons desire to possess the bodies of human beings. They seem to have a desire to occupy a body at all costs. Now go to the book of Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28. Matthew chapter 8. In verse 28, we find here one of Jesus' most remarkable examples of demon possession where Jesus cast the demons out. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them, unheard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. Now notice verse 29. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And this statement seems to reinforce what we know about the ancients' views concerning the demons. It was viewed that because the demons were half angelic and half human in their origin, that they were allowed to roam free upon the earth until the day of the Lord came. And so when 
Jesus cast these devils out. They're saying, have you come to judge us before the time? They knew that there was a specific set time in which they were ordained to face the judgment of God. And so... The demons were asking Jesus, Have you come now to cast us into the pit? Have you come now to punish us? All right, notice verse 31. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. Notice their desire to be embodied at all times. Cost. All right, turn over to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 43. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Now I want you to notice that the demon-possessed man serves as a house for the devils. House is a scriptural term for the body. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul said, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The house refers to the body. And I would suggest to you that the demons want a house because they have been unclothed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 4, For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. In other words, these demons need a body because the one they had has been destroyed. All right, go to Isaiah chapter 26 in verse 14. We're going to start wrapping all this up. Isaiah chapter 26. Look at verses 13 and 14. Verses 13 and 14. O Lord our God, other lords beside Thee have had dominion over us, but by Thee only will we make mention of Thy name. This sets the giant context of this passage. The Israelites had many times been under the dominion of the Philistines and the Philistines had giants there living with them. Remember Goliath and his sons. All right, verse 14. They are dead. Another example of where the King James Bible translates Rephaim as dead. They are dead, they shall not live. They are deceased, they shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Notice here, we have a people who will receive no resurrection. They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. This 
passage tells us that these Rephaim will never have a resurrection because they were an illegitimate being that God never intended to exist. And notice the contrast with verse 19, what God says to Israel. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So there's a contrast here between a people who will not receive a resurrection from the dead and a people who will. Notice also that they will be forgotten, he says, and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. That's why that you just don't see a whole lot of archaeological evidence pointing to the existence of these giants. God intended them to be forgotten. Now we're going to end all this at the cross of Christ. Look at Psalm 22, verses 12 and 13. Psalm 22 12 and 13, and we're about to wrap this all up. We're going to wrap it up at the cross. Psalm 22, verses 12 and 13. We find a very strange passage here. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. Now, of course, Psalm 22 is the psalm of the cross. It is one of the great Old Testament prophecies of Jesus' death upon the cross. But notice we find at this scene the bulls of Bashan. We have before seen that Bashan was the land of giants. And it should be pointed out that in Hebrew cultures, devils were often represented as animals. Examples of this would be found in Isaiah 34, 14 and 15 and Revelation chapter 18 and verse 2. Bulls were worshipped throughout the ancient Near East. The Canaanites worshipped bulls. The Egyptians worshipped bulls. Aaron made a golden calf for the Israelites. When Jeroboam set up his apostate religion in Israel, it centered upon the worship of bull calves. And the Babylonians believed in a class of demon that they called the bull Colossus. And remember that according to the Bible, those that were worshipped by the ancients were the devils. Verse 13 in this passage is reminiscent of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 where the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I don't think it's any accident that these demonic beings are associated with Bashan in light of how the Hebrews view demons or devils. We might expect it. There was more going on at the cross than what we suspect. There was a spiritual conflict going on between the Lord Jesus Christ and the unseen spiritual realm. The Lord on the cross faced the fury of the unseen realm. And at the cross, Christ won a victory over all the spiritual powers. Over in the book of Colossians chapter 2, 
verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, And you being dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now we're going to give an altar call. <laughs> All right, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the truth of God's Word, Lord. We know that there's things in God's Word that's hard to believe and hard for us to understand. But Lord, we pray that we would take your Word as our final authority and to follow it wherever it leads us, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.